The world of Avatar has been expanded. Back on July 23rd, we received the latest installment of the novel series, The Reckoning of Roku. And in this video, I'm not gonna just gonna talk about my opinions on the book. I am going to be mainly talking about what did this add to the cultures and pre-existing characters of the Avatar universe. So what did we learn about Roku from this book? Number one, we learned that Roku had a twin brother named Yasu. And the reason we didn't hear about him before is because actually Yasu has been dead for a very long time. While him and Roku were about 12 to 14 years old at the Fire Nation Academy, Yasu was killed by being pulled out to sea by a rip current. And it wasn't until after Yasu's death that really bonded Roku and Sozin. Not that they weren't friends or close before, but the death of Yasu was definitely the catalyst that made them as close friends that we see in The Last Airbender. And the last thing I'll mention here is that Roku actually believed himself to be a false avatar, very similar to how Yun was to Kiyoshi, where he believed that Sozin or even Yasu should have been the avatar over himself. And what we learned about Sozin within this book is that he visited Wan Tong's library and he was in search for fire bending advanced techniques, things like iridescent fire, jet propulsion and combustion bending, just to name a few things. He, we also learned a lot about his family tree, his father, Fire Lord Taiso, mother, Fire Lady Heizai, and his sister, Princess Zason. And furthermore, we learned that Zason is actually a non-bender. And this was also making her doubly loathed by her father, Fire Lord Taiso, because he's an asshole. He hates her for being born a girl and a non-bender. With Gyatso, we actually learned that he has a sister, not just a sister as in a nun, though she was a nun. We learned that she was also a blood sister to Gyatso. Her name was Yama. And she also, just like Yasu with Roku, passed away before the events of the book by actually a sinkhole while she was providing aid to a town nearby the Southern Air Temple. We also learned as a fun little note that Gyatso himself came up with the term Flamio Hotman that we see Aang say, of course, many times throughout the original Last Airbender cartoon. So it was cool seeing that Gyatsu came up with that. It actually makes a lot of sense in hindsight. We also learn a little bit about Avatar Kiyoshi from Sister Disha, who is both one of Avatar Kiyoshi's final Avatar companions, but also Roku's airbending teacher. We learned that Kiyoshi, the reason that she had lost a lot of her humanity and was so detached later in life was because she had lived such a long life. She lived to be about 230 years old that this, this grew on her a sense of ruthlessness, merciless, and a general loss of humanity. So we actually get an in-universe reason as to why Kiyoshi was as tough as nails towards the end of her life. She just simply lost connection with her humanity. And lastly, we learned a bit about Tom Min, who of course goes on to marry Roku. We know from her father that he wanted Tom Min to actually be dating Prince Sozin for pretty obvious reasons. This is before Roku was discovered to be the Avatar or revealed to be the Avatar, and dating Sozin would give their family a bump in political power. And Tom Min, of course, wanted to be with Roku. That's very much a like young, awkward love between the two of them that is very, very adorable. We also learned from Tom Min that she has a lot of drive and ambition herself. She wants to become a diplomat for the Fire Nation, and she actually gets her first missions in this book that are more plot related, and I will leave for you guys to find out on your first readings. With the Air Nomads, we actually learned that they can and have banished nomads from their own temples. This is more or less reconfirmed as we find this out more within the Yang Chen novels, but it is still interesting nonetheless. Then, of course, we learn that airbenders early in their training learn how to set dislocations because of how common new flyers fall off their gliders. And the third thing I found this most interesting is that despite the vegetarian lifestyle of air nomads, they are allowed to eat meat only when somebody offers them the meat first. So there's actually a scene in this book where Roku offers Gyatso a piece of meat, but Gyatso still declines. He explains that he can eat it, he just chose not to. 
We of course learn a lot about the Fire Nation considering Roku himself is a Fire Nation avatar. And with Fire Nation avatars specifically, they tend to focus more on their home nation, more relative than avatars born from other nations. Sito also especially was guilty of this. And I actually have a theory that Avatar Sito may have indirectly caused the 100-year war. Video for another day. We then learn that there is a phrase that Fire Nationals say to one another, may their flame light our way, which is said in condolence to the dead, to honor them. We then learn that hair in the Fire Nation is actually very sacred to them. The more it is forcibly cut, the more shame it is to show. And lastly, we learned that iridescent fire or different color fire is specifically created by enhancing the heat from one's firebending. Now, I'm gonna kind of lump earth and water together really quickly, just because there isn't a lot about the water tribes that we learned about in this book. With the Earth Kingdom, we actually learned actually three interesting things. One of which is reconfirmed that the derogatory slur for an earthbender is that of a dirt eater. But we also learned the Queen of Amash, whose name, Goshen, and the Earth King, Jalun. Forgive me if I mispronounce those. And then what are some other things that we learn about with the world of Avatar? Number one, we learn about, of course, with Wan Chi Tong, not only was he visited by Prince Sozin during the events of the book, he was, of course, also visited by Avatar Sito, and that both of these visits were before the banishment of humans to read and be in his library, though he still asks for his donation. Then, of course, we learned from Sister Disha herself the existence of another avatar. Of course, there's 10,000 years worth of avatars, but very few of them are named. We learn of a new one, Avatar Zalir, who was from well before the Fire Nation itself. She is presumably from the element of fire. That's, I guess, a way we could phrase it. And we learn a bit about her build. She's athletic. She had very short cropped hair and that she wore a sleeveless tunic and a particular skirt. Now, was anything retconned? And I don't think much, if anything, actually is retconned from this book. The only thing that I could really think of was Froku and Sozin's friendship was pointed at a different angle. What we see in Avatar The Last Airbender in those flashbacks is after Yasu's death. So it's not as much from birth that I, at least I expected their friendship to be. They were friends throughout their entire lives, but it wasn't until after Roku's twins, Yasu's death, that they become as close as we see in Atla. It's definitely a reframing of their friendship, but it's... I wouldn't call it too much of a retcon. It just adds to the story, in my personal opinion. Their friendship is never diminished from what we see in Adla. Now, what were my thoughts on the book as a whole? And if I had to give a ranking out of 10, I would say it's between a six and a half and a seven. I would say it is a very welcome addition to the world of Avatar. It's just the weakest of the Chronicles of the Avatar novels thus far. And that makes a bit of sense in that this is a new writer for these novels. The first four were all written by F.C. Yi. This book was written by Randy Rebay. So it could just be that it's a new writer. He's getting a feel for the universe and that could be the reason why it might be, in my opinion, the weakest of the five. It is still very, very fun to read and it's still a great story. What I wanted more of was actually weirdly Tom in. I wanted to hear more about Herb just because she shows up in the beginning of the book and she leaves before the main story even starts. Once Roku and Gyatso leave for this mysterious island, we never hear about Tom in other than like one more scene just third party knowledge that she's you know talking to the earth king or she's dealing with earth kingdom matters it's kind of i i weirdly wanted more of tom Min in the story and if i wasn't listening to the book through an audiobook while following along with my physical copy and taking notes all the information about the longbok clan longbok tribe i would have gotten so lost if i was just reading or just listening to this book uh, it, it was a bit hard to follow who who everybody was, what their roles were, and yeah, I would have definitely gotten lost if I wasn't taking notes and reading it and listening all at the same time. Would I want a sequel? Yeah, I actually would really like a sequel. I think this could be a case of the first book is solid, the second book is better. What would I love to see from that sequel? Like I said, I would love to see a more Tom in. 
And what I would actually think would be a great version of this story is Kyoshi really set the world up in a great way. She was one of the best avatars. She created a 230 years of effective peace as the end of her second book is still within her a normal lifetime. And when it comes to Roku, I've always pictured him being born in a time of peace. There wasn't a lot going on for him to affect. He was more or less just a deterrent for Sozin in starting the 100 year war. So what if his stories are more personal in that maybe once he gets married to Tommen and maybe even has his firstborn, what if there's a story where people are actively trying to get rid of the Avatar again? What if Sozin's sending assassins out to kill Roku to enact his plan of sharing all of the Fire Nation's glory? And Roku, of course, has to defend his family. It becomes a more personal story. We can focus a bit more on the romance of Tamen and Roku, something that isn't well explored a lot in these novels. The closest we ever get is Kyoshi and Rungi in the Avatar Kyoshi novels. So it would actually be really cool to see a, instead of an offense where something's happening in the world and the Avatar has to step in to bring balance, what if people are actively going against the Avatar specifically and Roku has to defend him and his family? It could be a cool twist that we don't normally see with Avatar stories that would at least give these books their own identity and reasons to read them, even if they're not majority of people's favorites. And there are my thoughts. Let me know about your thoughts on this book if you've read it, or let me know your thoughts on my thoughts in the comment section down below. And then if you've made it to the end of this video, you likely like my content, so go ahead and click that subscribe button and leave a like on this video if you haven't already. And then if you are interested in more Avatar content, I of course do my Avatar trivia series every month with a new short every single day. And if you also like live streams, come and check me out on, like, on YouTube or even Twitch if you prefer that experience, link as well in my channel. And I go live around 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time for three to four hours on every Sunday and Wednesday evening. So go ahead and follow me again there. And yeah. Shameless plugs aside, thank you all for watching and have a very lovely day.